Time Magazine, when we had the opening of Expo 74, they purposely hyphenated the name of Spokane to say Spo-Can, the city that can. first day they announced they're going to do a World's Fair, you can just imagine the eye rolling and just the jokes. Everybody said, oh, Spokane, there they go again. In the middle of the Cold War, it brought people together. Sometimes you get just the right level of ambition and something can happen. They made it happen through sheer force of will. Expo 74 has arrived at a position where it's going to go for sure. It is my high honor and privilege to declare Expo 74 officially open to all the citizens of the world. And it opened up and, and practically, it feels like overnight, uh, changed the complexion of our community. I'm on the road again, this time to Expo 74 in Spokane, Washington. In the early 70s, downtown Spokane had a different look. Filth, dirt, crime, gritty, uh, scary. As a kid, I never really remembered knowing that there was a river down here. It was such a blight. There were so many railroad tracks. And warehouses and who knows what else on what is now our fabulous park. The World's Fair turned train tracks into tourism. The stars came into alignment on this one, for sure. The World's Fair turned doubters into believers. There were a lot of naysayers, people who said, this could be a glorified county fair. People would say, they're crazy, they're gonna ruin this place, it's terrible. With the help of one man's vision. My dad just loved the city, he believed in it. This dream became a reality. The quote from King Cole way back in the day was, this is about saving downtown, this isn't so much about throwing the world's fair. I couldn't even put in words when I think of King Cole. You believed in the fair because you believed in King Cole. I think my dad, it was the right person at the right time. Spokane was never the same after this six month event. Oh, I think it was revolutionary. It was better. I try to stop and picture this city had we not done Expo. I think it saved Spokane. Now, 40 years later, we remember and celebrate. I spend my life marveling at how we ever accomplished it. Expo 74. Hard to believe it's been 40 years. Good evening, I'm Dan Kleckner. And I'm Stephanie Vigil. It's been nearly 15,000 days since President Richard Nixon stood on this very stage right here and welcomed the world and Spokane to Expo 74. More than 85,000 people looked on that afternoon, but before this massive celebration, there were years of discontent, both here at home and abroad. Here's Alex Rozier. It was a time of great divide. As America moved forward in the middle of the Cold War, President Richard Nixon tried to move past one of the biggest political stories of the last century. The whole Watergate scandal broke in about 73, I believe it was. So there, there had been a lot of attention in the news to whether or not he knew about this break into Democratic headquarters. While Watergate dominated the national headlines, a gas crisis made news as well. At this point in time, it's too early to tell what the extent of the shortage will be and what the effect it will have. They were putting the squeeze on the price of oil, and of course, gasoline prices jumped, uh, transportation shipping prices jumped, uh, agriculture prices jumped because of diesel fuel, and so all of those were worries. We have had verbal assurances that there will be adequate gas supply to handle the needs of tourists visiting the Spokane area. 
In the midst of these global issues, Spokane, Washington attempted the unthinkable. I can remember one reporter telling me that some of the Washington state officials said it was downright embarrassing what we were trying to do here. I do urge our citizens to encourage the Expo 74 organization to explore every possible means of continuing this tremendously important project. They were audacious, they thought big, you know, they went for the, the silver bullet solution and, and, and that can be kind of a, you know, poo-pooed, but dreamers, you know, kind of create the future and that's what uh, happened here. Spokane wanted the 1974 World's Fair but the city wanted to host it here at the longtime home of the railroad. There were two levels of railroad that came down what is now Spokane Falls Boulevard, which was then called Trent Avenue. If you pardon me, it was sort of like the red eye district of Spokane. The railroad tracks were hiding the river and the north side of our community from the south side. To get even to see the falls, you'd walk under these tracks and, you know, there were pigeons and pigeon droppings and you sort of felt you were taking your, your coat and your suit in, into jeopardy walking under there. Despite the mayhem before a possible move, the plans for a World's Fair were in the works. It called for a brand new 100-acre park 8,000 tons of asphalt, 3,000 trees, 16,000 flowers, and 50,000 square feet of grass. But if this was going to happen, there were several big moving obstacles in their way. Getting them all to move to one track was sort of like, you know, Hercules. I mean, nobody thought that could happen. So how'd they pull it off? We couldn't depend on the trains. We had to do something to save the economic viability of Spokane. And that was one of the driving forces for why the businessmen got together. I remember the day that, that Dad got the, the railroads to agree to move. He said, you know, if Expo doesn't even happen, I don't care. They will have a park, we'll have something. That story's still to come on a World's Fair 40 years later. Many consider it Spokane's greatest challenge. Those same people also consider it its greatest reward. The same railroad that once played host to a booming industry quickly became home to plenty of problems in the early 70s. It was gritty and, uh, you know, a lot of crime and, um, you know, it was a place we were told not to go, do not go down in that area. Um, and so we didn't. You just think about how the West was won, you know, they just ran railroad tracks out here, you know. And uh, Spokane was lucky enough to get one of the first ones and they got a couple more and pretty soon there's a tangle of railroad going everywhere. It's, it's funny how what is at one point a great triumph of industry becomes an eyesore later on. One time we had five uh, major railroads coming through here and the reason their tracks all went through here was to look at the falls from their passenger trains. At the time, no one wanted to come downtown. Because of that, businesses were failing and buildings were falling apart. City leaders knew they needed to move the railroad. It began to fit together in the sense that there was something for the railroads and for the city and for the state and everybody to gain. And nobody was a big loser. You know, it wasn't good for the railroads to be all over the place, so it really made sense for them to co-locate as well. But just going around and making that happen was a huge deal. The railroads were pleased to get off of the city street. The city streets were pleased to get the railroads off of them. Well, I think it was the, the clearing of the railroad tracks and, the, and the restoring the, that part of the downtown to the downtown and in effect becoming the catalyst for everything else that happened thereafter in the downtown and in the community. As a railroad relocation got underway, so did the effort to bring a World's Fair to Spokane. I know that at one point, people of Spokane thought they had voted down this World's Fair idea. All they had done was voted down one option of paying for the World's Fair. The strong majority of our people want the exposition to take place. I deeply regret that the vote was two or three percent short of enough to validate the bonds. Without Expo 74, Spokane will suffer a tremendous loss. 
unless the community can find a way to bring it about. The local business community and the Board of Directors and Spokane Unlimited came up with another concept and that was that the, the local business community would tax themselves in some form of business and occupation tax. We were providing for a business and occupation tax on certain businesses. For Spokane, having a B&O tax was absolutely unheard of. You know, four of our councilmen were up for re-election, including my husband. And we had uh, threats, you vote for a B&O tax and you're going to be, we won't vote for you again, we'll get rid of you, on and on and on. Kenny, hi. Jones, hi. Roger, hi. But the council did it. And the city council just uh, kind of gave that incentive to the uh, businesses, small and big here in the downtown Spokane, saying, listen, this is the incentive, you're gonna get a lot of money. That was the beginning and the start to get the funding that we had to have to start the whole process. But it hadn't been for those people, this never would have happened in a million years. So the Spokane business community and the city council stepped up. And when the railroads moved out, the World's Fair moved in. But I assure you, uh, we have critical paths on all of this and we will be ready, we will be open. And I think they were still nailing things, you know, uh, the day before, you know, getting it all finished and it was all kind of a frenzy at the end. It was the biggest party Spokane has ever thrown, but without one man, none of this would have been possible. I'm an extremely proud daughter and I know I speak on behalf of my family that, and my mother, that um, you're just, we're so inspired by him and we think of him daily and we're grateful that we were, were a part of his life. Up next, how King Cole forged a vision that changed our area's destiny forever. And I remember being on the grounds of Expo and he would be equally generous and hospitable to the VIP or celebrity down to the maintenance person who was working and sweeping the grounds. He, um, more than anything, wanted us to construct our lives to leave the world a better place than we found it. And that was his mantra his whole life. Making me cry a little bit, but it's true. It's fitting they called him King, because without this King, Spokane would look a lot different today. You know, what does the man in the street think about Expo 74? There would have been no Expo 74, there would be no Riverfront Park. He was raised Catholic, went through the seminaries, um, didn't finish seminary school to go to the Philippines towards the end of World War II. Came back and met the love of his life, Jan and then married and had eight children. King Cole moved to the Lilac City in 1963. He had a law degree, but he came from California to work as a city planner. In the 40s, he was out at Farragut, the Navy station there, the Navy base, and came in and visited Spokane and talked about taking the trolley up the South Hill and never forgot it. And so when the job opened, uh, when he was working in San Leandro and saw that it was a Spokane job, he was like, Jan, <laughs> you know? back up the kids. My first memory of dad when he moved to Spokane was that he was asked to be the executive secretary to Spokane Unlimited and that was to revitalize the downtown core. We've gone from a 16 million dollar idea to a 42 million dollar facility from a 28 acre site uh, which just surrounded Havermail Island to a 50 acre site. He used to tell people when he came to Spokane from San Leandro, the first time he came up here for an interview, they brought him downtown. He stayed at the Red Path Hotel, and our Red Path Hotel had a King Cole room. And he said, here I found, I had a bar named after me already. So he said, I found my spot. And you know, that was the way he was. He just, uh, he, he just fit in. He was a born optimist. When things always were challenging, he'd remind us that we could do it. <laughs> yes, you can in Spokane. In 1970, Cole came up with the unpopular idea to throw a World's Fair. We know it's an important idea, now what do we do? But despite continued criticism, he pushed the fair forward. 
people would say he wouldn't let it die. He just wouldn't let it die. And, you know, one person told me it died half a dozen times, but King wouldn't let it die. We have things like the Washington Street Bridge, which is a problem in Spokane no matter whether we have an expo or not. When these things got tense, I used to have a hard time with it. And I'd go into his office, he'd be sitting in his desk with his feet up on the desk, with his rosary in his hand, sitting there saying the rosary. He was just an amazing guy, that's all. As a historian looking at George Washington and the American Revolution, obviously just one man out of uh, tens of thousands that fought in the Revolutionary War, but a lot of people came to love the Revolution because they loved George Washington, and I think King Cole had that same quality. There were naysayers, but by the end of the fair, they were coming up to Dad and shaking his hand on the fair site and going, man, I did not think I know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a convert. Through King Cole's perseverance and ideas and dreams and looking forward instead of backward and, and trying to make things happen that were positive, the World's Fair happened. I put the success of the World's Fair squarely on King Cole's shoulders. He was... Uh... Uh, died on December 19th, 2010. He was at the veteran's home. He had some medical issues and peacefully died in his sleep. Um, buried at Immaculate Heart Retreat Center's uh, Queen of Peace Cemetery up there on Browns Mountain. King Cole's final resting place lies high above this city he loves so much. It was one of his favorite spots, so he's buried up there. Though his days on this earth may be over, his legacy lives on. His legacy, I think, for me is um, and it continues this way, um, is to give as much as you can to the community in which you live. His legacy is for those people out there that are, you know, think, think big things for Spokane and is, is to believe in it. But I'm proud of, of his hard work and I'm proud of his uh, dedication and I'm proud to say that his children, all eight of us, have that same set of values. Now, none of us are World's Fair consultants, but everybody in their profession, whatever they've chosen to do, is really making a difference in the world. And that's my dad's greatest legacy, I think, to the city and to his own family. King Cole was never a surgeon, but this man revived the heart of downtown Spokane. Today, we celebrate that accomplishment. In 1972, it became clear that Expo was headed in the right direction. The business community helped support the project. The city council gave its approval, and the railroads were on the move. But if the World's Fair was going to be a success, the city needed to finish the site. And leaders needed help from people worldwide. Here's Alex Rozier with the chaos before Expo. relocation left a constant construction project for much of the early 70s. But Expo President King Cole found the dirty demolition to be one of the most beautiful moments of his life. One of his goals was to get those tracks out of the way and he talks about a time when he drove from South Hill downtown to his office and for the first time he kind of zeroed in on the fact that the tracks were no longer there and I'll never forget his saying you know if I died at that moment my life would be fulfilled. Those damn tracks were out of the way. Where does this place the river beautification plan within this exhibition scheme? It puts it about 20 years ahead of schedule, in my opinion. As the city focused on building the fair site, King set his sights on selling Spokane. The U.S. Department of Commerce that was the sponsor of the pavilion uh, found a guy named Peter Spurney who just put on the uh, Washington, D.C. air show. I feel very confident that uh, our 4.8 million projections will be exceeded. I feel that this is a great show and one that many, many people will want to come to. And he ran the day-to-day -day operations of the fair, and, and King then was free to go out and do what he did best, was to sell uh, the uh, exhibit space and to sell people around the world on the idea that we're going to have a World's Fair in Spokane. The tumbling waters of the 
river on the north side. I mean, King Cole's out in Iran meeting the Shah and visiting his family and convincing them to bring a, a pavilion to Spokane. I mean, it was crazy stuff that they accomplished. He was gone a lot, you know. I mean, I remember him gone more than being home uh, from 70 to 74. It was, he was just traveling all the time, convincing people to come. <laughs> hereby officially and formally declare this to be Canada Island from here into perpetuity in honor of our good neighbors to the north. Ultimately, 10 countries agreed to attend. This is part of the Australian Pavilion, right next to the beautiful Spokane River and Falls. There were thousands of musicians scheduled and businesses built exhibits as well. Welcome to the General Motors personal rapid transit vehicle. The door will close when the close button is pushed. We're happy to participate in what we believe will be a stimulating Spokane World's Fair. So this one happens to be about the Western Electric Company and how it fits in with the Bell system. There was a, a meeting at Anthony's, or a lunch at Anthony's, for representatives of Ford and General Motors and other American industries. And it was in August, and they wanted to persuade these people to come to Spokane. And one of the big selling points was the falls. Well, everybody knows that in August, the falls are in somewhat lame. The beautiful setting is there, but there's not much water. But what they'd done is they'd planned in advance, and so they had the meal away from the windows. At about one o'clock, someone, maybe King Cole, said, have you seen our falls? And they said, no. And they walked over to the windows, and the water was just rushing down as if it was mid-May. And what they'd done is, of course, they, they controlled the falls, and they just opened up the water and let it rip for about 20 minutes <laughs> and then they left and that was the impression though of the falls and it was a legitimate impression because when the fair started that was one of the great great settings the falls people will enter the exhibit to see sharing the environment from the promenade which will be along here it wasn't long before expo 74 announced its theme celebrating tomorrow's fresh new environment I think it was listed as the first environmental fair that had ever been attempted. The theme is, these are the mistakes we've made, but this is what we can now do to change it and correct it. It's going to be positive and upbeat and purposeful and action-oriented. Spokane was one of the first little towns, perhaps, or town, to really uh, emphasize the fact that uh, living within your environment had responsibilities. We've been wasting our resources for the past 20, 25 years, and it's finally the government and the country and the public are beginning to realize that as rich as we are in our resources, there is a limit, and I think we've reached it. I loved how that was the theme, and then we cleaned up the river, we cleaned up the area. It was just all so um, congruent. We came up with the idea back in January and February during the fuel crisis uh, of, of riding bicycles from Fort Lewis to Spokane for Expo. I just remember it now that I look back uh, how uh, forward thinking we were back in 1974 to think about recycling and wasting water. And I remember going into the U.S. Pavilion when it first opened. There was a bathtub there with running water and it was telling you how much water we waste if we kept even a drip going at a certain speed. Maybe somebody would be sitting around at home and see or hear about nine guys riding bikes 533 miles. They might think twice before jumping in their car to go two blocks to buy a loaf of bread or go a mile and a half to go to work or something like that. Maybe they could ride their bike. Today we're looking at possible global warming or climate change or whatever you want to consider calling it. And those were part of the discussions in 40 years ago in Spokane, Washington, Expo 74. Man and his environment. So the theme was picked, the train tracks found a new home, and the park was ready. Almost. The lawn uh, out in front of the U.S. Pavilion only went down essentially 24 hours before the fair was open. So all of this is happening, and then the President of the United States arrived. The opening day of Expo 74 next on a World's Fair 40 years later.
When dark turned to light on May 4th, 1974, it was clear Mother Nature gave Spokane a beautiful gift. And lo and behold, the day of the fair, opening day, it was glorious. The sun came out, hadn't come out in days, and it was warm. It was one of those first warm May days we had. It was around 70, it was perfect. Blue skies, sunshine, color like you wouldn't believe. As 85,000 people packed the park for the opening ceremonies, President Richard Nixon landed at Fairchild Air Force Base. At the time, Nixon was um, deep in the crisis of Watergate, and the, the story is well authenticated that, that he arrived at Fairchild, got out of the plane, had a preliminary interview uh, with the press and with Governor Evans there, and apparently Governor Evans introduced him and he said, Thank you, Governor Evidence. And at that point, just a few days before, it had been revealed that evidence of his, uh, his misdeeds in the White House had been verified by tapes. That was the evidence. And so it was very much on his mind while he was in Spokane. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Nixon. But he rallied and, and went downtown and, and uh, gave the opening words. It is a great privilege to be here on this sparkling, beautiful day. I can remember we had security people on top of the pavilion over here that were there as, of course, Secret Service. And we had, I'm sure, frogmen underneath the stage. And I mean, it, it was a different kind of experience for most of us. At 12 noon, on this day, acting in my capacity as President of the United States, it is my high honor and privilege to declare Expo 74 officially open to all the citizens of the world. I was on these very steps as part of the press corps, and uh, it, it was an exciting time for Spokane. I mean, you're standing there in awe, thinking, this is a World's Fair. I've got President Nixon. He delivers the opening comments and then he walks right beside me. And I, I'm, I'm looking at that thinking, this is, this is unbelievable. The opening ceremonies were timed, uh, they were exact, they were spectacular, they were show pieces. It just went like clockwork. They had like at least two microphones so you never had to wait for somebody to come and speak and music and swans and balloons and I think fireworks. They released uh, 1974 trout into the river uh, to represent 1974, of course, and also as a, a, a uh, little bit of a token and, a, and a, a proof positive that we did clean up this area. We made it livable and sustainable for for nature to come back and live. Tommy Walker has to be given an awful lot of credit for opening day. He was um, at one time employed by Disney in charge of all their events and he was responsible for the opening ceremonies. I don't think I've seen Dad look that excited, you know, um, about, about anything he's done before or since. I remember when there were 1,000 days to go and I am here to very briefly pay tribute to the people of this community, of this state, of this region, and of this planet who have overcome insuperable obstacles during that thousand days to make this exposition the success that it is now today proven to be. He was busting with pride for the city that we had so many people there, the weather was perfect, Everything came together. The countries actually showed up and Spokane did it, and nobody thought we could. And with that, the six-month celebration was underway. During that time, the park was packed almost every day. People came for many different reasons, but the big draw, the entertainers. It was, for a person who was involved in the entertainment field, it was, it was heaven. When we return, a look back at the popular performers who helped make Expo 74 sing.
Years of concern led up to Spokane's World's Fair. Even when they were, were scraping the dirt, there were people that were saying, I can't see it happening. But they did it. They did it. They pulled it off. And, and it really was a remarkable transformation. You know, if you saw like what I saw before this all came about, the, the transformation for Spokane and especially the downtown area, it's incredible. There was no doubt about it that uh, a lot of people didn't feel we could pull it off. But in the end, 5.2 million people made their way to Expo 74. Come on through it. Come oh, through it. There. <laughs> it really was a miracle in a lot of ways that we had uh, hit 5 million visitors. I think they said we could break even at 3.5 million. And to hit 5 million, again, was amazing. Families came from every part of the world to check out the many attractions, but it was the performers who quickly made the Lilac City the heart of the entertainment industry. With a rag and a shoebox, really was just 13 or so. I'm on the road again, this time to Expo 74 in Spokane, Washington. Whether it was Bob Hope or Ella Fitzgerald or Liberace. I fell in love with Liberace. He was absolutely the best fair tender I ever saw in my life. I have a framed poster of his performance and in on it he wrote, love your opera house and love Spokane, Liberace. As, as we meet here today to celebrate the opening of Expo 74. Danny Kate came to our house for dinner when the fair opened. I thought that was really cool just because we had watched White Christmas, you know, as a family a lot. Captain and Tennille. Okay. Big fan. That was great. <laughs> Jack Benny. Uh, Vicki Carr. I've got a picture of Vicki Carr. Every day was somebody or something new and exciting. I remember meeting uh, Olga Corbett. She was one of the first uh, Russian gymnasts in the old days that had a 10, as opposed to these new numbers that are going on. Merle Haggard, Tom T. Hall, Rolf Harris. Timey kangaroo down the sport. Time the kangaroo down. <laughs> we had Rita Coolidge and Chris Christopherson, Bill Cosby, John Denver. There were hundreds of professional performers, more than 1,200 amateur artists, and 4,500 concerts. Holy mackerel. I, I mean, and you figure all of these people were there within six months. As the shows went on, the Cold War did too. Security has really tightened up here at Expo 74. Season passes have to be revalidated. Cars and trucks are being checked carefully as they move on and off the site. And guards are just about everywhere. This is Bob Baker, Q6 News. Despite that, the Russians maintained a strong presence in Spokane. The Russian pavilion was the largest international pavilion we had here at the World's Fair, 55,000 square feet. And by the way, that was more square footage in one pavilion than all of the international space at the 1962 Seattle World's Fair. The director of the Soviet pavilion uh, was deserved it by the fact that B-52s were flying over his pavilion. <laughs> and, you know, he thought they were taking pictures or what were they doing? Why is a B-52 flying over our pavilion? And the fact is they were they were going into Fairchild, and sometimes they had a pattern. And they'd say to, to, to King Cole, you know, you've got to stop this. And King Cole would explain, it's just a landing pattern. It's not about you. So there were those kinds of, of misunderstandings, which fortunately never got to be a real crisis at all. But kind of within the, uh, within the, 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 the framework of the World Fair and the basic goodwill that's going to be part of that, um, Russia was still Russia, the U.S. was still the U.S., Germany was still Germany, Austria, Australia was still Australia. As the international community came together for this global event, the leadership in Washington, D.C. was breaking apart. This is NBC Nightly News, Friday, August 9th. Good evening. There were two presidents in the White House today, Richard Nixon on his way out. Four months into the fair, President Richard Nixon resigned following the Watergate scandal. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. So we had the President Nixon opening the fair. 
Thank you. And we had a different president close the fair. President Gerald Ford made the final remarks from the nation's capital. Tonight, the first World's Fair dedicated to the environment and the first major bicentennial event comes to a close. You knew that the end of the World's Fair was the beginning of something else. Expo 74 was a huge success. It turned a profit and, of course, left behind one of Spokane's greatest treasures, Riverfront Park. This park, though, is 40 years old now. It's time to look forward to the future. Uh, I just hope that the community realizes what it has here. I hope that we maintain this park. Uh, you know, uh, it is such an important legacy, and it melds the south and the north part of our cities together. So what is next for Riverfront Park? That story straight ahead. You're watching a World's Fair 40 years later. This weekend marks the 40th anniversary of Expo 74, but it also marks four decades since the opening of Riverfront Park. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people visit, but as the park gets older, it needs more work. Alex Rozier now with details on the plans for the future. So many people consider it the heartbeat of our community. Along the banks of the Spokane River, patched by the pavement of the Centennial Trail, Riverfront Park epitomizes Spokane's slogan. Near nature, near perfect. Where else except in New York do you have a downtown park that uh, is, is a center of activity uh, for all time now, for, for the rest of the life of our great city. And uh, up until 1973 or so, nowhere was it uh, considered to be a, a gem of a park as it truly is now. As we talk to our visitors, as we do studies of our visitors, you know, many of the attractions within Riverfront Park enjoy a huge popularity amongst our citizens and our visitors. The popularity of the park remained strong in 2014, but in the past year, a committee convened with the goal of relaunching the riverfront and beyond. You know, our goal as a committee is just to create a place that can accommodate a lot of activity to the point where, you know, 10 years down the road, other, other things are sprouting up around the park, you know. More people are living down there. More people are using it for different reasons. People are starting businesses in the neighborhood. And, and you could just see a connection from, you know, downtown River Park Square, right across the park into where the arena is and, and spreading out over here towards Kendall Yard. Obviously, you walk through the park, it, it, everybody loves the park. It's, it's like our heart and soul. But, you know, I think when you look at it close up, you, you realize it's showing its age. It needs, you know, fresh coats of paint, uh, new paths. The structures over there, they're aging, the IMAX theater is aging, you know, the, you know, within a few years after the fair, the tarp that was in the U.S. pavilion, you know, wore out and they had to take it down. They've had a lot of changes over there. We're really thinking about now, the kids who are nine years old now, who's moving forward and, uh, you know, what kind of a place are we going to create here for them? I mean, the King Coles of the world created a really cool experience for all of us kids and, and now it's our generation's turn to try and, you know, do something similar. But I would say to all of our citizens uh, in the region uh, that we also have to dig deep and, and talk about uh, the passion and the commitment that we do have for our community, but really take action on that passion. This is not a passive passion. Uh, to make things like this happen, we need to be energized. We need to get involved in making our community what we want it to be for ourselves, but more importantly, for those that follow us. Though opinions may differ on what to change in the years to come, it seems everyone agrees Riverfront Park is a Spokane staple that must be maintained. Just about everyone who has spent time here in the city has memories from right here in Riverfront Park. And as we know, some of those memories came during Expo 74. Can everybody say, oh, you know, that's a pipe dream, it can't happen. But it did, it was great. When we return, one final look at the magic of this historic celebration. But one of the real miracles of the World's Fair, besides 
The fact that it was extremely successful was the fact that the railroads left the downtown core uh, perhaps a hundred years before they might ordinarily have left and gave us the opportunity not only for a World's Fair but also for a downtown park for all of uh, Spokane forever. Over the last four decades, much has changed in the city, yet much remains the same. Expo 74 only lasted six months, but the pride sparked by that event has never left. Alex Rozier now with some final thoughts of the lasting legacy of the World's Fair. Perhaps it was that much nicer because few thought it was possible. Just a celebration wasn't going to do it. When King Cole said he wanted to bring a World's Fair to Spokane. We kind of thought he might have lost it. <laughs> people laughed at him. But he uh, never let go. And it wasn't long before the King's vision was embraced everywhere. He was so proud of it. It's just the irreducible humanity of King Cole that I found impressive one-on-one -on -one, and that Spokane found impressive 200,000 on one. People started to think, well, why not? You know, a lot of people played a role and it was just a, a great example of the community just realizing, you know, we're gonna float together. We're gonna rise, the tide's gonna rise us all. Everything seems to be roses here at Expo, or at least that's the viewpoint from General Manager Peter Sperney. Sperney says, Expo is right on track with its schedule. He said for the fall months of the fair, Expo had predicted 10,000 persons per day in attendance, but they're averaging 18,000 persons. 5.2 million people made Expo 74 a Spokane success story. No other city our size has even tried to put on a World's Fair. 40 years later, that success continues. You know, if there would still be trains running through downtown, what wouldn't we have now? Well, we wouldn't have the park. We wouldn't have Hoop Fest. We wouldn't have Bloomsday because you couldn't run through all that. It wasn't only a great event at the time. Uh, the real legacy is what was left and what was, uh, what's been built after the fair. The World's Fair built a beautiful park so many still enjoy today. But more than that, it built the belief that in Spokane, Washington, anything is possible. I think it was probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. All you need is a dream. So this is my child season pass from Expo 74 World's Fair, that's me at eight years old. Um, my mom, I can still recognize her handwriting there filling it out, that's my signature circa 1974. It was really cool, it was like, uh, you know, it was like the Spokane County Fair for a whole year and uh, so it was a great time to be a kid. He would make up things, you know, towards the end. <laughs> my mother, even though now she has Alzheimer's and she could still correct him. That didn't happen, King, you know, and he'd be like, I'm pretty sure there were six million people the first day at the fair. No, you know, but you know, it's just, she was so proud of it. Once you get over the hump that you realize you can do seemingly impossible things, that your default answer is not, no, we wouldn't be able to do that. The default answer now is we can do that.